David Brooks, great to be with you. Thanks for talking to Unheard. Could you give us just a kind of overview? Um, so you, had, you, you climbed in your life what you call the first mountain, yeah. um, achieved a great deal of worldly success and a lot else, and then you crashed down into a valley. Right. And so there's a book about moral renewal, how individuals and societies get out of the valley. And so the nature of the valley, I think for me personally and for society in general, is that we live in a culture of hyper-individualism, a culture of meritocracy, which tells us certain lies, that career success can make you feel fulfilled, that life is an individual journey, that you're not a soul to be saved, you're a set of skills to be maximized. Mm -hmm. And subtly the message it sends that people who are smarter and more successful are worth slightly more than everybody else. And that's a very pernicious signal to be sending. And so I played that game, the meritocratic game, and I had way more career success than I ever thought I would. But I found I was getting more disconnected from others, from my friends, my, my relationships. And so in the 2013, I just sunk into a valley where my marriage had ended, my kids had gone away to college or were going to go away. And I had, I had weekday friends who I could talk about work with, but I didn't have that many weekend friends, the sort you actually do life with. And so I had spent that period alone and realizing that it was in part a failure of myself and a failure of values. And so I've spent six years thinking, how do you, how does a person or how does a society get out of that valley? Is it quite a brave departure for you, do you feel? I mean, to kind of go into your personal journey in that way? In the first draft of this book, there was no ver none of me in it. But a friend said, you, it's a book about relationship. You have to talk about yourself. And the only way you build relationship is with vulnerability. And so I thought I should be vulnerable. And I think the problem I had, which is a problem of disconnection, I wasn't really in deep relationship with people, is a problem, frankly, a lot of people have in society. There's a great rise of alienation, great rise of depression, suicide rates rising, all, and tribal warfare. All this is because of alienation and bad relationship. We're so used to reading these kind of social science books, which right. are packed with charts and right. backed up with data. Yours isn't. Right. It's more like, this is my experience. I think this would be relevant to other people. I think one of the great descriptions of writers is that we're beggars who, find, who told other beggars where we found bread. Right. And so I think a lot of people uh, just, we all want to lead deeper and better lives. That's just part of human nature. And I happen to spend five years reading a lot of books about it and coming across a lot of quotations that help me understand it and quotations and bits of advice and maxims that put a name to things that I think a lot of us feel intuitively. Uh, one of my favorite lines in the whole book is from a friend of mine. Uh, she said when she had her daughter, she found she loved her more than evolution required. Mm. And I always like that because we all do things for evolutionary reasons. Sometimes we do things to pay the rent, but there's an extra layer of enchantment to human life, which is the love a mother has for her daughter, which is you know Mozart, which is mm. Chartres Cathedral. Uh, and so paying, at paying attention to that extra layer of magic uh, I think it's an important part of life, and I want to try to understand how does that magic enter into us and how is it created. When critics say, you know, where's the evidence, right. just because this worked for David Brooks, who says it's going right. to work for anyone else, what is your response to that? Yeah, well, there's some data about our social problems, about the levels of alienation, distrust, suicide rates, deaths of despair, but there's not all that much. It's mostly, you know, when, you're, when your heart is swelling with joy or whether your heart is constricted in pain, there's like no data for that. Yeah. Uh, whether you feel your soul sore or whether you feel degraded, that's not measurable. And so a lot of the most important parts of life are beyond measurement. And that's just a fact of human nature. And if we reduce everything to neuroscience, which I wrote a book about, and if you reduce everything to data, which I put in my newspaper column a lot, you're missing the, the elemental aspect of life. Mm -hmm. And I just uh, wanted to put that front and center. Like, Life is a qualitative experience, not a quantitative experience. The quality of your relationship with your friends is what really matters. And that's really, you can measure touch points, but you really can't measure the qual how good a friend are you. Mm. And it sounds um, Christian when you're mm -hmm. talking like this. Right. You, you, it seems like you keep the kind of overtly Christian stuff almost to the fringes. It's not an explicitly yeah. Christian book. Right. But have you found that it's resonated more with Christian audiences and are you yeah, careful about that? Not really. I mean, I, I think you don't have to be Christian or Jewish or Muslim or even religious to believe that you have a soul. And I, I try to say that, you know, if you believe in God or not believe in God, that's not my business. But I do ask you to believe that you have a soul, 
that there's some piece of you that has no size, weight, color, or shape, but gives you infinite value and dignity, that slavery is wrong because it's an obliteration of a soul. Rape is not just an attack on physical molecules, it's an attack on a soul. And so what our soul gives us is moral responsibility. It makes us all equal because we're not equal in height. <laughs> uh, we're not equal in, uh, in our brain power, we're not equal in our muscle power, but our souls are all equal. And that's the fundamental basis of human equality. Uh, and our soul yearns to be good. Everybody I've ever met wants to lead a good life. And that source of desire to be good is a very powerful motivator in our lives. And mm -hmm. if you're not taking account of that motivation, you're really misunderstanding human beings. And I do think a lot of economic and social science research assume that people are driven by self-interest. But I look around the world and I meet a lot of people who are really driven by a desire to be good with others. Mm -hmm. And so we've taken, we've, we've underestimated ourselves. So do you think we have become overly focused on economics generally in the car culture? I think we've become overly focused on it. Uh, and our view of human nature has been too much shaped by the economic model. And so my shorthand is we become... Do we blame Adam Smith? Or who, we, who do we blame little, for this? Smith was okay. He, he had the theory of human sentiments, which really was about right. all this. But there was a strain of enlightenment thought uh, Locke, Rousseau, other. Mm -hmm. Somebody pointed out that there were about five or six key figures in the rationalist enlightenment. Mm -hmm. None of them had kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, the, and, and plus they were certain sort of male, frankly, mm -hmm. and therefore they were blind to the systems of care that were surrounding them that were being built by women. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that male, highly rationalistic enlightenment thought sent us a skew. Uh, and uh, didn't, like in Hobbes, his state of nature, he imagines our state of nature, there are no families. It's just mm. raw individuals. Mm. Atomized. And it's hard to have individuals without families. Somebody has to give birth to them. Mm. And so it's, a, it's uh, an abstract view of human thought, and I think it sent us screening off in a slightly wrong direction. So are we looking for a pre-enlightenment? Yeah, uh, going well, back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how far are we going back? Uh, yeah, I used to say you can define a conservative by how far back they want to go right. to, um, but yeah, we're not going back. No. And so we had a, a so we sort of had a 1950s sense of community formed during the war, really, and that was a tight form of community, but it was also very stifling. Mm -hmm. It was very racist, very sexist, and we were right to leave that behind. Right. But we've had 60 years of individualism now. And it's, we've sort of run out the string on that one. So it is, if it's not going back, it's still a correction. Right, and a correction toward, toward community. So I say we're, we're too individualistic when we should be more communal, we're too utilitarian when we should be more moralistic, frankly, and we're too uh, rational when we should be more emotional. And so we went from a culture in the 50s, we're all in this together. We're getting through the war of the 40s mm -hmm. and 50s. Then in the 60s, we had a culture, I'm free to be myself. I just want freedom. Mm -hmm. And that was good, but we pushed it too far, and now I think we have two options. One is revert to tribe, where we all sink back into our ethnic tribes or some other tribe and we war with each other. And the other is I commit to you, that we, that we build our lives around commitment making and about making promises to each other. And the argument of the book is that a really, really well-lived life uh, is based around four big commitments, not all of them, but usually, to a spouse and family, to a philosophy of faith, to a community, and to a vocation. Mm. And if you commit to f three or four of those things, uh, and you commit deeply to them, and you execute your commitments well, you'll probably live a pretty joyful life. The community one of those three is particularly interesting yeah. because you, know, you mentioned these two different directions, tribalism or some yeah. a, a better version of community. It's kind of how you define your community that's the key question, isn't it? Right, the, a kind of ethno-nationalist has chosen right. to define his or her community as their race. Right. Um, someone else may choose it as their online forum or whatever. It's like what, what scale and which communities are going to count in this modern world? Right. Yeah, and, and I make a distinction between tribalism and community. And community is something you, you're joined by a common love for something. You all love your town. You love a cause, whatever. You love a faith. Uh, tribalism is organized, it's a common bond, but it's a bond built out around a common hatred. Yeah. You all hate an other. So it's, it's always us, them, friend, enemy distinctions. It's a zero sum mindset, they're trying to get what we have. It's a scarcity mentality and it's always build walls, erect barriers, fight back. And if we, if we enter the 21st century as just reverting to tribe, it's not gonna be a very pleasant century and, and we've mm -hmm. gotten a good start 
on that so far? What I think will be the, the challenge with this is that we talk about a kind of correction from a, a, a liberal res revolution that went too far, but what that will sound like to people is less freedom. Yeah. You know? And that's the kind of PR challenge for any of these kind of ideas, right. that if you say to people, you've got too much freedom, you're still gonna have freedom but just a little bit less, right. that's not gonna be a vote winner. Or it's I've really come to think the, um, the definition you have in your head of freedom is tremendously important in determining how you live. So there are a lot of different word, meanings of the word freedom. One of them is absence of restraint. I got no ties on me. Freedom from. Freedom from. But then there's freedom to, or the capacity to. If I want to have the freedom to play the piano really well, I have to tie myself down and practice every day. And so you have to bind yourself down in order to have the freedom to do things. And the classical version of freedom too is if you don't discipline yourself, you'll be a slave. You'll be slave to your passions. Slave to your vices, slave to your fears. So total freedom is not actually freedom after all. Right, and when I was in my, um, the dark phase of my life in 2013, I really discovered that freedom sucks. That uh, political freedom is great and economic freedom is pretty good, but social freedom, being unattached, mm. uh, is really not a good feeling. And you're just unremembered because you're really uncommitted to anything. Mm. And so uh, tying yourself down socially to others or to causes is a way to give yourself much more power than you would have if you were just unrestrained. From the heights of what we were talking about right to the dregs, Brexit yeah. uh, is obviously an issue that's totally paralysed and dominated our politics for the past couple of years. Do you think there are lessons from the kind of things you're talking about in your book to our political situation here? Yeah, I do. I do think when you um, leave people naked and alone without healthy communities, they uh, do what their evolutionary roots tell them to do. They revert to some form of tribe. And so one of the things you notice about uh, the Donald Trump vote, for example, the people who voted for Trump, they had okay incomes, but they were living in communities that were struggling. And so they were living in communities where they were seeing their kids not get jobs. They were living in communities where opioids were spreading. And they saw the social fabric tearing around them. And so they felt threat and with some legitimacy in rural America, in Iron Rust Belt America, in the north of England, you have seen communities that have been struggling. And at the same time, you see communities that are going through a gigantic and unprecedented demographic transition. Mm -hmm. And so a certain number of people are gonna say, my life is getting worse, strangers are coming to my town, this is not going in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, and so in my response to both Trump and Brexit, and I realize they're different, is that they're the wrong answer to the right questions. If then we are now, as two societies, the US and the UK, in the valley, is that not a, maybe a more optimistic take of where we are? Maybe this is creative destruction that is necessary uh, for people to reach the kind of realizations you're talking about. Yeah. Do you feel more optimistic now than you did five years ago? For sure, for sure. Because I do think you, know, you are what you make of your valleys. And I think Brexit and the Trump victory have taught us a lot about our countries. We learned a lot what other people were thinking that were maybe not in our social circle. And so that was tremendously informative. And I do think uh, societies move forward. They learn. You, you end the book uh, with something called the Relationist Manifesto, which is a, a bold word and sort of implies a political movement. The chapters or the, the sentences are then numbered in what looks a little bit like a biblical <laughs> setting. So it's sort of halfway between a Bible and a political program. I read the Communist uh, Manifesto before writing it, which right, is an right, right. excellent book, by the way. The Marx and Engels were really good. Um, but, you know, I think, I, I wonder if you have thoughts on vocabulary, because, you know, that we had a communitarian yeah. thing around 10 years ago. Uh, people have tried, you, you're using the word relationist. People use the word post-liberal, there's the hard center. There are all sorts of right. formulations people are trying to come up with to describe this. And it always sounds kind of academic and not like something that an ordinary person is going to get up and get excited yeah. about. So the word I use now is, is weavers. Is, and the pe I've spent the last couple of years traveling around the country meeting people who are really good at building community. And what they do is they're weaving. And so that's my word now. I think the there's weaver party. We could, you know, could call it the Weaver Party or the folk group, but you know there is a communalism of the left, yes. and there's a communalism of the right, and I would like to see both. <laughs> I'd like to see more of both. It's going to depend on the the words used, isn't it? Because part of this sounds sort of 
conservative right in a way, the kind of Christian right, and the kind of solidarity community element sounds very old left. Um, in a way, it's the kind of it's the it's the attack from both sides, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's we're at a time, and I think in my political journey, I've moved economically left and socially right, <laughs> and right. so I'm much more willing to use government to enhance a little equality than I was 15 years ago when, or the high date of the Thatcher era. On the other hand, I'm much more respectful of communal norms and much more disrespectful of the idea that everybody gets to live the lifestyle they want because we have effects on the people around us. You say you've moved economically left. left. Um, do you think the whole system needs radical reboot? I mean, I, you, you don't mention the word capitalism very much, uh, if at all. Um, and I just wonder whether the kind of emphasis on scale and efficiency and justifying every aspect is kind of going directly on a collision course with everything you're calling for. Have you become an anti-capitalist? Uh, no, but I've become a little skept more skeptical of it. I do think capitalism has a tendency to rationalize selfishness yeah. and tell yourself it's okay to be selfish, that society will work well if we're all selfish together. And I don't think that's true. And so I do think you Capitalism pushes us in a certain direction. It's dynamic, but it's also individualistic, it's selfish, it's disruptive. And so we need things that push in the opposite direction. And some of those are government, but some of those are cultural, where you say, no, I'm not selfish. I don't want to be selfish with my whole life. And even if I'm in business, I'm going to be a servant leader, not just a ruthless capitalist. And so each individual person within a capitalist system has to have one half mentality here but another half mentality saying, no, actually, I know what the most important things in life are. I'm going to put restraints on my selfishness, buttressed by the state sometimes. When you look at the overall state of the world, the US, the UK, do you feel like the, the, grand, the new grand bargain, the new settlement that you talk about in the book is achievable? Do you think there is any, is it in sight that this kind of new kind of compromise could be reached? Yeah, I do. As I mentioned, I think the civic renaissance is happening. I think I see a lot of people groping to the similar sort of ideas where none of us are there yet. Mm -hmm. But whether it's center left or center right or even on the extremes, there, there's a new order that's forming. A lot of books are moving in this direction. A lot of organizations are moving in this direction. And I just have confidence in our ability to figure it out. Um, I look back on the history of nonfiction and it's always too pessimistic. It's always the end of this, the decline of this, the death of this. And in reality, we grope our way forward. Uh, and I think, you know, there are certain moments that are historical transitions when we chop up the old order. And 1968 was like that. Uh, 1848 was like that. Uh, we get through those moments. And 2019. Those, 2019, yeah, it's like that. And so in, when you're in the middle of the moment, like well, if you're in the middle of 1968, the world seemed to be falling apart. Yeah. Uh, but figured stuff out and so we muddle through and I am a big believer in that we will muddle through and find a better cultural answer and then that'll kick up its own set of problems and we'll have to do it all over again. We will find our second mountain and climb it. We will. Hopefully. <laughs> David Brooks, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. It's fun.